I'm Janet Jacobson. I'm the director of the Barnard Center for Research on Women. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this evening's event, Caribbean Feminisms on the Page, with Jamaica Kincaid, Tiffany Yannick, and Kayama Glover. It is my pleasure to introduce the um, author, if you will, of this event, who is Tammy Navarro, who is the Associate Director of the Barnard Center for Research on Women. Um, Tammy Navarro is a cultural anthropologist. She earned her PhD at Duke University. Her research interests include Caribbean studies, gender and labor, development and capital. And she's currently at work on a manuscript entitled Virgin Capital, which I think is a fabulous title, Financial Services as Development in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And it explores the way in which neoliberal initiatives advocate, which advocate the freeing of markets, build upon, and often lead to the entrenchment of existing processes of racialization. Um, she has already, in her brief career, um, received a wide range of support for her work, including awards from the Mellon Foundation, the Social Science Research Foundation, the American Anthropological Association, and the Ford Foundation. And she has taught at a number of institutions, including our colleagues at Rutgers University and Wesleyan University. And um, she came to us, the year before she came to us, she was a visiting scholar with our good colleagues at the Institute for Research on Women, Gender, and Sexuality at Columbia University. Um, but I really want to take this opportunity to say something special about what it means to be working with Tammy Navarro and what brought us here this evening. Um, this is Tammy's first year as Associate Director of the Center for Research on Women. Um, and she came to us as a person who had this extensive uh, scholarly experience, important research uh, behind her, but what we didn't fully know until she started working with us is that she is a person of immense energy and vision. Whenever anyone joins the Barnard Center for Research on Women's Staff, I write up a memo that's supposed to get them through the first or maybe first couple of weeks of uh, their work. And I, Tammy is the managing editor of our web journal, The Scholar and Feminist Online, so I suggested she read the, all of the back issues over 13 years, um, which she finished in two days. I was a little bit at a loss, but nonetheless, I knew I was working with somebody special. So when she suggested that perhaps we should develop a series that focused on specifically Caribbean women writers and that we bring together young writers with their role models, the people who have had influence in the field, I knew it was going to be special. But here we are tonight and we can see that it's even more than I had thought it might be, and that's the kind of vision that Tammy Navarro offers to the center and to all of us this evening. So, Tammy Navarro. Thank you all for coming um, tonight. It means so much to me personally and professionally to see this room filled because this is a very important conversation, as you all know, and just the beginning, really, um, of what has become a series, and so we're, we're glad to offer uh, more programming in this vein in the coming semesters. Uh, so first and foremost, I have to thank our generous co-sponsors, Africana Studies at Barnard, the Consortium for Critical Interdisciplinary Studies, the Department of Women's, Gender, and Sexuality Studies, the Institute for Research in African American Studies over at Columbia, Small Acts, a Caribbean platform for criticism, the Greater Caribbean Studies Center at Columbia, and lastly, Gender Studies at the Eugene Lang College of the New School. So thank you to all of you for your generous support. As Janet mentioned, I'm the Associate Director of BCRW, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this exciting event. I have the honor of introducing our speakers this evening. The moderator tonight is Kayama L. Glover. Having come to Barnard at the beginning of the academic year, I was thrilled to find a community of innovative and engaged scholars, and Kayama is at the very top of that list. That her intellectual engagement is with the Caribbean, my own area of study only put her over the top. Kayama is the author of Haiti Unbound, a spiralist challenge to the post-colonial canon, and is currently working on a study of configurations of the feminine in Caribbean literature with the working title, The Audacity of the Eye. In addition to her own writing, Kayama has been a force in the development of Caribbean studies. She's a founder and co-coordinator of the Transnational and Transcolonial Caribbean Studies Research Group. She was recently awarded a two-year grant from Columbia Center for the Study of Social Difference to build and organize a working group focused on the theory and practice of digital humanity scholarship emerging from the Black Atlantic. And she's the recipient of a Schomburg Fellowship for her Digital Humanities Project in the same boat toward an Afro-Atlantic intellectual history. 
Next, we're honored to have with us Tiffany Yannick. She's from the Virgin Islands and is a professor in the MFA program at the New School. She's the author of the novel Land of Love and Drowning, which has won numerous awards, uh, including the 2014 Flaherty Dunan First Novel Award from the Center for Fiction, the American Academy of Arts and Letters Rosenthal Family Foundation Award, and is currently a finalist for the Bocas Prize. She's also the author of a collection of stories, How to Escape from a Leper Colony. Her writing has won the 2011 Bocas Prize for Caribbean Fiction, the Boston Review Prize in Fiction, a Rona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award, a Pushcart Prize, a Fulbright Scholarship, and an Academy of American Poets Prize. Tiffany's captivating writing has rightfully earned extensive acclaim. Her words transport the reader into a world filled with anxiety around belonging at the moment of the US purchase of the islands now known as the United States Virgin Islands and the possibilities of and for American blackness. Land of Love and Drowning is a novel set in the early 20th century that explores issues we continue to grapple with today. Yannick draws from and builds upon writing emerging from the Caribbean. And when I asked her to participate in this event with Jamaica Kincaid, here's what she said. I'm an anthropologist, so I'm gonna give you a block quote. <laughs> She says, Kincaid's narrative voice is one I fell in love with as a reader, and it has been the primary instructive instrument for me as I seek to create fiction with multiply voice narration. She is the living writer whose own work is most influential on my own by far. Though we don't know each other formally, and we hope to correct that this evening, her work is the primary influence on my own. So one of the things we hope to do at BCRW is to make connections between writers and researchers who are at the early stages of their career and the work of those like Jamaica Kincaid whose work is richly deserving of in-depth attention. It's difficult for me to articulate the significance of the literary impact of Jamaica Kincaid. The way she gives voice to her characters and grounds their experiences in detail. For scholars of the Caribbean, like myself, her work has been vital to the project of articulating the complexity of the Caribbean. Kincaid is the author of a great number of books, both fiction and nonfiction, including Annie John, The Autobiography of My Mother, Mr. Potter, and my personal favorite, A Small Place. She's the author most recently of the novel, See Now Then, which has won the Before Columbus Foundation's American Book Award. Ms. Kincaid is a recipient of many awards, including the Anisfeld Wolf Book Award, the Guggenheim Award for Fiction, and the Center for Fiction's Clifton Fadiman Award. She is also a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Letters. She teaches in the departments of English and African American Studies at Harvard University, and it's an honor to have her with us this evening. So we'll begin this evening with the authors reading from their work and we'll start with Tiffany Yannick reading from her novel, Land of Love and Drowning. Good evening. <clears throat> so I'm the one that um, dropped the mic in the beginning <laughs> because I'm so effing nervous. <clears throat> um, because whenever I'm asked to say who are my literary influences, I say that my papa is Gabriel Garcia Mock. Marquez, and my mama is Jamaica Kincaid. <laughs> and so I am totally freaked out. <laughs> okay, um, thank you to Dr. Tammy Navarro and to Janet Jacobson um, for their leadership of the Barnard Center for Research on Women, for hosting this event, for inviting all three of us to have a conversation, and for just doing the awesome work that you guys do. Um, thank you in advance to Kayama Glover for the conversation. Um, and it is an incredible honor to be reading on the same stage with you. Kincaid, thank you so much. I'm just gonna read from the beginning of my novel, Land of Love and Drowning. Owen Arthur Bradshaw watched as the little girl was tied up with lace and silk. He jostled the warm rum in his glass and listened to the wind. 
The storm outside wasn't a hurricane, just a tropical gale. It was the season for storms. Lightning slated through the heavy wooden shutters that were closed but unfastened. The thunder was coming through the walls built with blue bitch stone. There was no one outside walking in the rain. That sort of thing was avoided. A scientist visiting from America had brought the lace and the silk. They were all at the house of Mr. Lovenkrant, an eminent Danish businessman. Denmark was giving up on the West Indies and America was buying in, but Mr. Lovenkrant was not leaving. The scientist was tying the girl up. He was demonstrating an experiment that had become stale on the continent, an experiment of electricity. The little girl was very beautiful, and she was very little, and she was very afraid. She was also very brave. Captain Bradshaw thought on his daughter, Iona, who was not unlike this American girl, only Iona was more beautiful and at least as brave. The people who had come together to make Captain Owen Arthur Bradshaw could be traced back to West Africans forced to the islands as slaves and West Africans who came over free to offer their services as goldsmiths back to European men who were kicked out of Europe as criminals and to European women of aristocratic blood who sailed to the islands for adventure. Back to Asians who came as servants and planned to return to their Indies and to Asians who only wanted to see if there was indeed a Western side of the Indies. And to Caribs who sat quietly making baskets in the countryside, plotting ways to kill all the rest and take back the land their God had granted them for a millennium. Owen Arthur had been raised from a poor upbringing to a place of importance and ownership. He was the captain and owner of a cargo ship, and now he was among the important men who sat in this living room and watched through the haze of the oil lamps as a girl was hoisted off the ground via lace and silk and a hook in the ceiling. The little girl's body jerked as the American scientist hugged. Her body jerked until she was a few feet off the ground, but she did not cry out. Owen Arthur was not sure how much longer he could bear to watch, but it was essential for him to be at this gathering. The host, Mr. Lovenkramp, was a rum maker, and Owen Arthur had always shipped rum. But with Americanness would come prohibition, and Owen Arthur needed to ensure he was included in any of Lovenkramp's non-liquor endeavors. He pressed his own airlobe between his thumb and forefinger, Success and solvency should have been on his mind, but Owen Arthur could not help but watch this American girl with a father's tenderness. This little girl was pale-faced and blonde, and Owen's little girl, Iona, was honey-skinned and ocean-haired, but he still looked at this strange little girl as though looking at his own child. The first half of him desired that he had created this little girl. She was a pretty yellow thing. The lower half of him desired the girl. How young could she be? He put his mouth to his glass and tilted it until the warm sweetness met his lips. She will outlive me, he thought to himself. And who was the she he was referring to? Perhaps his wife, who was just then sitting at home doing the sewing it seemed God had created her to do, or perhaps he was speaking of his mistress, who was at that moment sitting in her home playing the piano he had bought her, making a music that only God or the devil could bless. Or perhaps he was actually speaking of his daughter whom he loved like he loved his own skin. Perhaps he was speaking of the little girl to whom the scientist was now attaching cords of metal. Perhaps the little girl was, in a way, all women to him, as all women might be to a certain kind of man. Owen Arthur is right. 
all these she's will outlive him, though he cannot bear the thought of his women going on. He knows his daughter will live forever in the way all parents do, simply because parents generally die first. But Owen will not die of old age. Owen will die of love. The Danish West Indies will become the United States Virgin Islands, and then this patriarch will die. And perhaps these things are the same thing. Behold, the American is saying in his strange accent. He hands the girl a glass ball and then whispers to her, do not drop it or I will punish you. She does not make a move to suggest she has heard. She only takes the glass ball in both her hands and then the first miracle happens. Her hair begins to rise. The storm outside begins to howl. Christ have mercy. This is what the Christians whisper. The Jewish and Muslim men for whom these islands have been a refuge mutter, oi gotten you and Allah Akbar under their breasts respectively. Yes, America will bring us progress. Here is progress before us. Lightning claws through the windows as though hunting and Owen Arthur watches the girl's hair rise toward the ceiling until it is sticking up like so many angel horns. Oh, the stories these men will tell of this night, how they will embellish one part and shrink another, how will they will make this night real again and again, some in Arabic or Danish or Yiddish or English, others in that Caribbean language that the tourist guidebooks will call Creole. The story will become more real than the night itself because the story of it will last while this wet night will soon be over and here we all are putting it down so that it may last forever. But Owen Arthur thinks on his firstborn, his only child thus far who has survived to life, his honey-skinned Diona. Her hair too has a life of its own. He has combed it himself and knotted it into braids and found that he can get lost in its forest. He collects the pieces of her hair from the brush and burns them himself so that no one can steal them and put a curse on her. Owen himself is not a hairy man. He does not even sport the sideburns so popular for men of this time and place. His daughter has the glorious hair on her head, but otherwise she too is smooth all over. Iona is so beautiful that many call her pure and think on the virgin hills, or they call her pristine and think of the clear and open ocean, or they might use terms such as untouched or undefiled, but then they are cautious because they know that their words alone might spoil her. So on damp nights, men imagine that they are angels and may touch her as they please, but when they wake, they sign themselves with the cross, and if available, they pat handfuls of holy water on their chest. They do not really wish to pollute little Iona. They only wish to witness a bit and then return like a tourist might. The American scientist takes the ball from this other little girl in this parlor, and now he prepares for the real triumph. He will make the little girl into a miracle. The scientist raises the vial to the little girl's face. The little girl is wise, as little girls must be. She does not flinch, but she closes her eyes. The scientist touches the vial to her nose. White light spark like lightning about her face. She cries out but the men clap louder. They have seen electricity, they have seen the future. Mr. Lovencrant, the scientist says, you must try. The vial is passed to the man of the house who has been standing near a window that is fastened but not sealed, the legs of rain kicking at his back. He steps forward and with great hesitation that might be called trepidation, were he not a wealthy man, he presses the vial to the brave girl's nose. He feels the shock in his hand and up his wet sleeve and lurches away. Mercy, he exclaims so loudly that no one hears the little girl cry out again. His face is hot. For a moment he had thought he would be paralyzed, but he had survived. Owen feels the rain sneaking through as kisses from a tiny mouth. Now he raises his hand. I should like to try, he says. The American scientist smiles as Owen Arthur steps forward. He passes Owen the vial. Owen walks towards the little girl. She is suspended so that he and she are level, their eyes meet. 
He bends toward her and caresses her airlobe gently, for he enjoys the feeling of that soft skin. Men are foolish when pretty girls are involved, he says, loud enough for all to hear, and then he dashes the vial onto the floor. The great men snort, many look away, ashamed that they had not had the captain's integrity. My apologies, Mr. Lovering Krant, I seem to have broken the American scientist's instrument. I'm afraid I have ended the game. Owen thinks on the major shipping deals he must have lost now, thinks on how his business has depended on Loving Krantz's rum for more than a decade, but then he thinks on something else. I fear most that it's past this little girl's bedtime. He touches the girl's hair, then tips his hat and takes his leave into the storm. Science is just the kind of magic, and magic just the kind of religion, and Owen Arthur knows all about this because Owen owns a ship, and men who spend their lives on water know that magic is real. Owen stands in the rain, the lightning brightening the way ahead of him, loving Kratz how so well positioned the center of town is not far from the opening of the sea. Wherever Owen goes, the sea will be at his side either way. A small wall of stone has been built to block the bay, so it is no longer really a beach, but a proper harbor. Still, it will be nothing at all for Owen to walk to the ocean right now. He has done it before. He has swam in this harbor as a boy. The ocean, look now, is coming to him. The waves are bounding over the seawall, leaping like animals, like little girls. Owen cannot decide to which house he will walk. If he keeps the sea on his right, then he will go past the market square where entrepreneur ladies sell their produce and straw creations. There, Rebecca lives in a small house with her sons. None of these sons are his yet. If he puts the sea on his left, he will pass the smaller fish market where men haul in the catch of the day before dawn. Beyond, Owen's wife, Antoinette, lives in Villa by the Sea. It is a wealthy but modest estate where their daughter and their cook and their groundskeeper all live. The house is at the shallow edge of a harbor. The living and dining rooms are separated from each other by a line of linen curtains, which makes the house feel like a ship at sail. From the villa by the sea balcony, the captain can see his own ship dock further into the bay. Now Owen thinks of the little girl's hair rising into the air and he faces the beach. He waits until his whole body has received the rain. Then he goes towards his Iona because the little orphan girl reminded him of her. Owen cannot see into the future, but he can see into the past and this is a magic we all have. As he walks, the sea is at his side, but the rain is at his back, pushing him toward his only child. The waves slip over his shoes. When Owen arrives, he goes to his wife, who is telling a story to little Leona in the parlor. This family will know itself through stories told in time and others told too late. In this way, they are no different from any other tribe. Holy ghost, his wife cries when she sees him wet, as though he's been drowning. Lady, Antoinette calls, a towel, a change of clothes for the captain. Iona has no restraint. She runs to her father and he picks her up and he puts her to his chest, even though he will make her wet and they will both be sick over this. At this moment, it is only the one child and she is in love with her father. It is no large thing that this daughter will in time kill Owen Arthur. No large thing at all. Family will always kill you. Some bit by bit, others all at once. It is the love that does it. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, so much. That was really brilliant, um, really wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, th I, I I don't 
know everyone's names, but I'm very grateful to everyone who organized this time. You certainly, I, in the past, and I spoke to um, all the time. And thank you for coming. This is um, really a wonderful tribute to your organization. Um, look at all these people here. Uh, and to lo the love for what you are doing. So thank, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm going to read from a book um, I wrote, and um, just give you so you're not at sea because I usually begin in the middle um, of everything. Um, I I have no beginnings or ends, only middles. Um, uh, it's a book about a family and um, in New England, and it's a mother, a father, a, two children. The parents have. No names, really. They are called Mr. and Mrs. Sweet. Um, the children are Persephone and Heracles, and they have those attributes. And <laughs> they live in a house called the Shirley Jackson House. Um, yes, not the Robert Frost House, the Shirley Jackson House. There's a reason for that. Anyway, uh, just a... Yes, it's a book about a family gone, life gone awry. So I read you two, I hope, brief passages um, from it. And this one, this is a point of view of the girl who's Persephone, and it's spring, so she's released from her imprisonment, in, which is in her father's pocket. And um, the other is the boys, Heracles, oh, so just those two points of view. So it goes like this. That afternoon at exactly quarter to four, the beautiful Persephone and the young Heracles got off the school bus and found that their, <coughs> sorry, and found that their mother, the dear Mrs. Sweet, was not waiting to pick them up. They saw the school bus, driven by the madly named Mr. Strange, disappear around the corner from, from the corner, disappear around the corner below the Bennington Monument. They saw their companions, some wayward boys and girls who lived in villages that were surrounded by evergreens of every kind, except for broadleaf. And the evergreens were all sick with a blight of rust. And these companions were very bad. <clears throat> for sometimes the boys among them pummeled the young Heracles almost to death, and the discipline he required to restrain himself from gathering them up all together in his large brown hands and making them as lifeless as his old socks was greater than the force he had used to smite the entire city of Thebes as it appeared in his handheld Nintendo game. Those boys in any case had names of no distinguished origin, their names being Tad, Ted, Tim, and such. But the bus stop was empty of Mrs. Sweet, and the young Heracles was beside himself with anxiety and sorrow, for he loved his mother so, and only so. And a dark cloud full of a toxic fire emerged from his forehead, and he directed it toward the top of the Bennington Monument, a structure that was dedicated to a battle that led to a defeat and a triumph, and the defeated and the triumphant were now settled into the normal disfigurement of everyday living. And he caused it to fall to the ground, just missing a bus full of citizens from Germany who were taking a tour of New England just then. So beside himself was the young Heracles with anger and grief over Mrs. Sweet not being there to greet him when the school bus arrived at the bus stop, that he sank to the ground, drew his feet up into his chest, his chin resting on his knees, so that he looked like an illustration of a fully developed child intact in his mother's womb, an illustration commonly found on the walls of a doctor's office. Oh, come on, and that was the voice of the beautiful Persephone, his sister, and that is as it should be, for it was spring, and she was released from living in the depths of the pocket of Mr. Sweet's old Brooks Brothers tweed jacket. 
Not knowing what else to do, she lifted him up with much ease as if he were some just harvested asparagus or a pint of strawberries or a plate of peas or as if she were removing the hamster that had died overnight in its cage. And she placed him in the right-hand pocket of her own jacket, which was made from polyethylene terephthalate, and the pocket itself was lined with rayon. Now, now, she said as she stroked the curve of his back with her thumb, her forefingers shielding his head with, which rested against his knees. It is very bad she's not here to meet us once again when we get off the bus from school. Where the hell could she be? What the hell could she be doing? Oh, she just sits in that room writing about her goddamn mother, as if people had never had a mother who wanted to kill them before they were born in the history of the world. And the stupid father named Mr. Potter, who couldn't even read, and the fucking stupid little island on which she was born, full of stupid people whom history would be happy to forget. But she has to keep reminding everybody about that place and those people and no one cares and she can't stand it and where is she she's in that little room off the kitchen and from that room she can see the kitchen and she's making us whatever we all want to eat and none of us want the same thing and how she manages to keep writing that shit make her stop make her stop before I kill her and it was so much better when she would only knit us stockings that were too big before they were washed and then were too small after they were washed. And they just gathered dust in the wash basket because she couldn't bear to throw them out after all the time she had spent knitting them. And the hats never kept us warm. They fell into our eyes when we were skiing. And I almost killed myself coming down that black diamond wearing the stupid hat she had stayed up making for me as a present. And it is the stupid writing. It is the stupid writing. It is the stupid writing that's keeping her from being on time to meet the school bus that was driven by Mr. Strange. Ralph is his name. Ralph is his name too, and that is not a name with a distinguished lineage. <laughs> and a man you know who should be locked up in a jail in a cell that is buried underground could come and pick us up and take us to his house and murder us or violate us sexually. And we would never be seen again or heard of again, not even be mentioned on the nightly news, vanish from the face of the earth like a species from a geological era that isn't even yet detected. What is she doing? What is she doing? What the hell is she doing? She's sitting there in that room at the big desk that Donald made for her, and she's thinking, thinking of a sentence and the way to end it. My mother would kill me if she got the chance. I would kill my mother if I had the courage. And as if such a thing were possible. She lives in that world of the room with the, dark, with the desk and the kitchen just beyond. And she leaves us here all alone for a man to murder us, for tourists from Germany to stare at us, for all the other children and their mothers to see that she doesn't love us. She only loves the world that she carries around in her head, a torrent of lies all in her head. We are nothing to her, nothing, nothing. Only those words in her head. And now look, the night is coming. The ink black night is going to swallow us up and we will never be found for we will be lost in the night, the night itself, as if it were the ink black sea. <laughs> Oh dear. Uh, I have one, one, the other, bo the boy's voice now, and then it's not too long, so don't worry. Um, oh now, oh then, said Mr. Sweet out loud, but it didn't matter. It was as if she said it to herself, for no one could ever understand her agony, ever, ever understand her suffering, her pain. No words could express it. Nothing in existence could convey or express her existence just then, now or ever. Her husband's voice, her husband had been enfolded in an entity called Mr. Sweet. 
I'm dying, she said to herself, but that was silence. I'm dying when I'm with you, said Mr. Sweet to Mrs. Sweet. I'm dying, and this is why I hate you, for I am dying, and I can't be myself, my true self. I am dying, and you will die when I say this, but I am dying. I'm dying, I am dying. <laughs> Oh, I see, said Mrs. Sweet out loud, but even she couldn't hear herself, and all that she saw then, now, was silent. But she could then see the young Heracles sitting on a couch in the children's room, watching Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen and Dennis Rodman defeat Carl Malone and jo John Stockton and Michael Jordan, who then had a very bad cold. And each time he made a score, he almost fell down. But his fellow teammate, Scottie Pippen, was always there to hold him up. And the young Heracles, who worshipped Michael Jordan, held his opponents in high disregard and said, they were lame. And Mrs. Sweet knitted and purled all the while, listening to her son whoop and shout and moan and cry out in agony at the very idea that his beloved Michael Jordan's team would lose. But then they won, and the young Heracles said to his mother, hey, mom. I know you're going to say it is just like Homer. This is just like the Iliad, and there is Agamemnon, and there is Achilles coming up to save everything. Admit it, Mom, you're going to say it's just like in Homer, in that funny little voice of yours, as if you're on the radio, because you talk like someone on the radio. Your voice is official, but you're just my mom, and you're so ridiculous. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do with you. You are so embarrassing. And Mrs. Sweet knitted away, for she was right then making the entire orchestra that would perform Mr. Sweet's Suite of Nocturnes. But much to her surprise, when this chore was completed, the performers were all missing one of the arms they needed to play their instruments. So inevitable are the series of events seen over your shoulder as you glance back from the series of events that stand before you. And in your own mind, you can see the series of events that are to come, that are arrayed before you. And they appear as if they are in the rear view mirror, but only in reverse. Only as if the rear view mirror could make visible the thing that has not yet happened yet. For perhaps time, said Mrs. Sweet to herself as she knitted away those garments with one sleeve missing, was a father, not a mother, and Mrs. Sweet had no father. That is, she had not been authored. She had been created by a very malicious woman. Oh, mom, oh, mom, can't you see, said the young boy to his mother, and he was jumping up and down, running this way and that through the assembled crowds of shy Myrmidons, Ninja Turtles, Power Rangers, Super Mario, Batman, various figurines from Star Wars, various stuffed animals, some resembling the domesticated, some resembling wild ones who were now extinct. And they all lay before him, and they also all lay before him in his memory. So fresh, so fresh and so clean. So, so sorry, Mrs. Jackson, that they, <laughs> that they still inhabited his now. And the boy, the young Heracles, was now involved in the sadness of worshiping, of worrying about Ken Griffey, whose father had been a legend of baseball lore. Or so the young Heracles told his mother, and the young Heracles loved the young Griffey, and so was involved in his fate, which might not be so full of glory as was his Michael Jackson and Scottie Pippen and Dennis Rodman. But just then, as he was sitting in his chair in the children's room, his father said to him, I must tell you something. And Mr. Sweet said, I don't love your mother anymore. I love another woman who comes from somewhere else, another woman with whom I have been taking ballroom dancing lessons. And we talk about Mozart, for she plays the piano forte excellently, and she could be the next extraordinary piano genius of the century, the centuries long, because centuries are long. Though in your life you might, ha, 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 
find them, not as long as I have found them, but I love her and nothing can change that, and I don't love your mother. You know, we were always so incompatible, for she did emerge from a boat whose main cargo was bananas, and she is strange and should live in the attic of a house that burns down, though I don't want her to be in it when that happens, but if she was in it when the house burned down, I wouldn't be, su wouldn't be surprised. She is that kind kind of person. And on hearing all this, oh no, was a long howl of pain that came up and out of the bowels through the darkness of the mouth of the young Heracles. And he furled and unfurled again and again like the petals of a flower as it comes into bloom and then fades rapidly. So did the young Heracles, who had only been sitting in his chair in the children's room, watching on television the young ball player Ken Griffey in the process of being or never being the great baseball player all the baseball world thought he would be. Thank you. I spend a lot of time with books and I forget that they're best when they're read out loud. So thank you so much, both of you, for those wonderful, wonderful readings of your wonderful works. I have um, about a hundred different questions that I want to ask you, um, but I'm going to pretend there are only four. So they're sort of like big questions, um, but I will just pose them and, and I'll just keep going until somebody outside like Tammy makes me stop. Um, and you should, of course, feel free to ignore anything that's not as interesting to you as it is to me. So um, I thought we might start with something really simple. Feminism. <laughs> Right, so uh, it's on all the posters. So I figure people might want to hear a little bit about that. So um, I'll ask the obvious question: What is feminism to you? More specifically, what is Caribbean feminism? And is what you do on the page, as it were, again according to the poster, is that Caribbean feminism, or something akin to it, or something you have ever thought of as Caribbean feminism? <laughs> Okay, ma'am. <clears throat> um, I teach a class called Girls at the New School where I'm an assistant professor. Some of my students are here. Awesome. Thank you guys for coming. <laughs> and one of the things that we talk about in that class is figuring out what girls, what women, young women, are doing in literature in general. Um, you know, what feminism might be attempting on the page in, um, in literature. And most of the texts we've been reading in class have been like American literature. And the way that we traced it a couple of weeks ago was first thinking that, um, that girls or, or women um, in a text uh, that we can think of as where women are being treated well and, and girls are being treated well, that first they have to have subjectivity meaning like first they have to have a, a sense of selfhood, they have to be fully fleshed out characters. And then after that, if they have subjectivity, then they get to have agency, which is, you know, you, they get to act, they get to move, they get to make decisions and act on their own decisions. And then maybe after that, they get to have adventure, um, which boys always get to have in their books. Um, but maybe if girls first have subjectivity and then agency, then they get to have adventure and go off and do fun stuff. Um, it seems to me, actually, like maybe Caribbean feminism on the page has always been allowing women to have agency. Even the old dead guys or the old guys who are still alive, like Naipaul and them. I feel like women... <laughs> um, that they... they even in those texts, it seems to me like uh, the women and girls in, in, in those texts always had agency, but in a sort of reverse way, often didn't have subjectivity. And I, I feel like that actually is maybe has been the condition of um, what, what girls and women are up to in Caribbean literature, which is that we were always doing stuff. Um, we were always active. But it wasn't always clear in the literature why and where the personhood was, be, was behind of that action. 
So I feel like the kind of work that I'm attempting to do and I'm, I'm following really in Jamaica Kincaid's tradition is, is giving the subjectivity back to the action, like putting it back in the order that I think it should be in, which is that first this woman or this girl has a personhood and then she acts and her action comes out of her character, out of her personhood. So I would say that for me, that's what the feminism on the page is about, is about returning um, subjectivity to our girl and woman characters. <clears throat> um, that's beautifully said, um, really. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Um, uh, put it, hold it. Oh, yes. All right. <laughs> I sort of think it might uh, attack me. Um, but um, I. I I say, uh, to, in, su in support of that, for me, f um, feminism, uh, or what, it's such a potent, fashionable word nowadays, everybody is, uh, or it's sort of a mark of a famous people, um, trivial people uh, are feminists or not feminists, and, um, but to me, uh, I would, I wouldn't, I don't even get to equal pay and all of that, um, which is very important. But for me, the most important, uh, what you call subjectivity, the most important uh, <coughs> thing for a woman, the most important right for a woman is to possess her own body and to have uh, the, the question of, the, of her reprodu reproductive rights, I'm not even sure uh, what it means. Um, it's sort of like uh, saying you should use your eyes or no one tells you what to see, you see. And uh, so it, it seems to me that, uh, or no one tells you that every 28 days you, something will happen to you. Uh, if you're a woman of a certain age, some, between 14 and 55, every 28 days if you're a woman, something happens to you, whether you like it or no. And, uh, and I often didn't like it. And, um, uh, and, but that, that, seems, that seems to me to be so much a part of um, my being that the idea uh, that anyone would have anything to say about what happens to my very body seems so absurd. I don't really know how to argue with someone um, uh, or how to begin to speak. I'm speechless in the face of reproductive rights. I have no idea what it could mean any more than seeing rights or breathing rights. It seems to me not something to, to be debated or to be talked about at all. It has nothing to do with anyone but each of us in our own um, um, private way. And I think what you were hinting at is that I was very much aware of my mother and her friends um, uh, <clears throat> in their way. And you mention it in, in your book, one of your characters um, have a, uh, um, uh, decides whether to bring uh, to fruition um, or to completion uh, her, her pregnancies, um, and she often decides not to for her own uh, uh, reasons. And so, um, I mean, you know, it seems to me that God forgives all sorts of monstrosities that men do. They go off and kill people by the millions, and they seem perfectly able to get into heaven. Um, <laughs> I don't see why one woman involved in managing her life is uh, involved in criminal activity. So I don't, uh, for me, uh, a feminism, um, I don't really know how uh, to talk ab ab about the rights of, of a woman, except if a, a woman, for me, the, the, the right for a, the, a woman's right to a private conversation with her own body is not a discussion. Thank you.
So then I, I'm going to pick up on something you've just said, a word you've just used, which is a, a big word, freedom. And I, I want to ask you both to think about freedom and how you write freedom for women overwhelmingly, yes, but for men as well. Um, but not the kind of freedom that looks like heroism, sort of a more banal freedom, um, freedom in its least glorious forms in a certain way. And even more than that, I want to push you to, or I want to know the answer to a question about the freedom I read in the characters in your work, when that freedom looks almost misanthropic or even pathological in some ways, right? When that freedom tips into isolation or indifference or um, alienation vis-a-vis -a, -vis a wider community. And so I, I, I want to know how free you think your characters are, if you think about that at all. Do you judge them? Are you empathetic towards them? Do you condemn them? Um, yeah, freedom. Oh. <clears throat> um, oh, gosh. My characters, I'm not, I'm not the kind of, I'm not that kind of writer, I'm afraid. Um, I don't, I'm not the kind of writer with a plot and a character who does this. I, um, sometimes they, you know, I, I never think of, of um, the freedom of, of, uh, of my, my characters because, wh why? That would imply that, you know, I have something to work out. The, the thing that I have, um, what makes me write? I'm very interested in uh, the powerless, um, and I start with myself as a child, and then I've become an adult um, who uh, and, and the, lives in a powerful uh, society. So I'm very interested in um, how power works in its most intimate form, especially. Um, there is nothing, there isn't uh, anyone more powerless than a child all across the board, and uh, no one more powerful than uh, a, a man, really. Um, um, well, they divide power between themselves. They, ha they distribute their gradations of, of, of power. Um, but. For the most part, that's what I'm interested in, and, and um, so freedom, I don't, it's not something, you know, I entirely understand. I mean, I, I understand what it is not to be free, but freedom then becomes, uh, uh, itself becomes complicated. And I was aware of this reading, um, once again, reading a, a narrative of Frederick Douglass, and you know, he's a slave, so he be becomes free and then you know life begins and life as a as a free person which is much more more most desirable it's most desirable to be <laughs> um, a, a, a free person but then um, living itself is is something else so just the other day when I'm having a difficult time someone said to me that Betty Davis once said living is not for sissies <laughs> <laughs> Living is not for sissies. Um, so in, in my novel, I am actually actively engaging in these ideas of freedom. And for me, the opposite of freedom is not slavery, but is belonging. Um, and that's the way that I, is dichotomize a word? Okay, we'll make it a word for now. Um, that's the way that I dichotomize the, the, the ideas of, of my book. Um, and so there's a sort of political thread in my novel that is about what it means to be the Americans in the Caribbean and the idea that you're, we're owned by the land of the free. And so we should feel this sense of freedom, which we obviously do have to some extent. We carry American passports and that gives us a certain freedom of travel, et cetera. Um, but also the, the, the opposite issue of belonging, politically for people from the Virgin Islands, that's really fraught. You know, do we belong to the region that we very much want to belong to when the region is like, y'all are the Yankees in the region? Um, or do we belong to America? And when we, 
when we find ourselves in the States, we are made to understand immediately that we've immigrated um, into our own country. So um, there's this, this sort of, um, I would say this like tension around issues of belonging that arise for the average Virgin Islander. And even within the Virgin Islands, there is a, there's an ongoing conversation about who is a native Virgin Islander, who's a local Virgin Islander, who are the long-term tourists, who are the actual tourists. This whole idea of like who belongs. And I think that comes from our fraught identity as the Americans in the Caribbean. Um, so my novel is politically about that, but it's also about uh, two sisters, who, uh, Iona, who you heard from in the beginning, and her younger sister, who does make it into life, um, despite her mom's um, hopes otherwise. <laughs> Uh, she, those two sisters are orphaned. You know this really early. I'm not spoiling nothing for you, don't worry. Um, but you know, you know really early on that they're orphaned. And so for them too, they're going through their own thing of who do they belong to? Do they belong to their family? Do they belong um, to themselves? Um, do they belong to each other? And one sister really seeks out freedom and the other seeks out belonging in a really aggressive way. But of course, all of this is just really about myself, as fiction ultimately is. And um, I, my grandmother raised me, and I, for a long time, I have a part, I shouldn't tell too much of my business, but I have, I have a part of my family that I didn't really know that well growing up, but I carried their last name. And I always felt like, well, I am this on my birth certificate, but I wasn't sure if I belonged to them. Um, because of my, my parents weren't married, and I didn't take my biological father's name, and then I didn't know my mother at all growing up, so I really myself was fraught with who I belonged to, and so I just really have sort of transitioned those issues into, um, into the novel, and I think, I think for me that, that continues to be fraught as a psychologically, and probably it will be what I always write about, um, you know, the, that space between freedom and belonging. Okay, I have to warn you all, I no longer have only four questions. Uh, so, you know, stop me when you have to, but I'll try here. Um, I'm not necessarily done with you on freedom, but I'll spin it in a different direction and see if, if you want to pick it up. But, um, so, bringing that back into the conversation a little bit, but also extending it toward the question of family, uh, specifically with respect to women, mothering, daughtering, which is now going to be my word, um, and the constraints or limitations that I think in both of your, your fictional writings, and certainly also in your non-fictional writings, is very much present. Um, so thinking about that question of freedom or and or of family, um, and how you grapple with that issue of belonging versus constraining, I suppose, um, and still the question of responsibility then as a woman with respect to that. I once read in a book, and it's a book by Jamaica Kincaid. <laughs> Do tell. And I tell it to my students all the time, but now you know it's really hers. Um, and I, I'm going to misquote it completely, and it's going to be embarrassing. But the, base, the idea that I tease out in my own work, and I talk to my students about it, is that the place that you are from and, and, and the person that you are are inescapable. Is that something yeah, familiar? That really <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that you, there's, like, you cannot escape the, your personal, your geographic, your ethnic, your everything history, that you live with it, you carry it around in your body, on your skin, um, in your psychology, it's just inescapable. And that there's something profound about the place that you are from um, and the place that has created you or the places that have created you. So I would say actually um, that that relationship is, uh, is, especially for women, as we think about where we trace our traditions, um, I think it's, it's sort of like fashionable to say like, I'm doing my own thing. I am, I'm pulling myself up by my own bootstraps. But that is bullshit. And there's no such thing as bootstraps. And, um, <laughs> and even if there were, you couldn't pull yourself up by them because that doesn't really make like how. Uh, so, you know, that, <laughs> the idea is that we come from a lot of this and we rely on all of that to, to be who we are. Even if we think of ourselves as solitary agents, we, we never are. We never are. I, I did say something like that and I was very gratified to read not too long ago, or maybe last week or maybe last, sometime very recently, that 
um, uh, trauma, you inherit, you can inherit your, the trauma um, of your parents. And I think the study had just been interviewing people whose parents survived um, the um, Holocaust. Um, but I knew that, uh, that, uh, that you inherit, um, I mean, how could it, why would it not be true? You inherit all sorts of things. Why would you not inherit the, uh, the memory of, and not just a generation or two, but how could you not inherit the, the things that you, the people you are from uh, um, have, have ex experienced? There's this um, desire, but, and it's an American one especially, I think, to think that you start fresh because of our history, you know, you come from wherever you come from and uh, you get here and you, you start with a, a, a clean slate. It's, it's why our country is, among the many thing, reasons our country is so peculiar. But um, <laughs> by that I mean fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, you, you, uh, you inherit um, all sorts of things, but in, in particular, I, I think the thing you, you not only inherit all sorts of things, but in particular, you create the thing, some things you will pass on. I firmly believe that something, some things happen to you uh, by the time you're seven, certainly by the time you're ten, and that is the rest of your life. Okay. That's very distressing. That's a, a lot of, that puts a lot of responsibility for mothers, it's, doesn't it, then? Yeah. I'm just saying, it's, but um, all right. Yeah. Uh, but, but, yeah. no, but no one is en entitled, or I won't even go into deserve, no one is entitled uh, to a life free of something. It's life, it's not for sissies. So you brought in ge geography, and you said, you said our country. And you were talking about here. Yes. So I do, you know, I've been immersed obviously in both of your works for a long time, but particularly in the last months. And so I went back to the beginning. I went back to a small place. And then I read, um, I reread Love and Drowning right after that. And what struck me in particular this time is that while both, you bring an immense bigness to these small places. You make them deep and rich and big despite the fact that they are neither large nor wealthy. But your novels and your nonfiction are filled with leaving and desiring to leave. And so I'm wondering about, if you could put that in the context of the fact that you are here and ask to what extent the where you're writing from conditions or colors the where you're writing about. Um, and then, you know, just the obvious question of home. You know, where is it, and um, is, it an, is it anywhere, or is it an expansive concept that allows it to be anywhere, or is it something that's just always there as a missing, or a longing, or an absence? Kayama, what an awful question to ask. <laughs> um, it's a brilliant question, an awful question to ask, um, because although uh, Jamaica is saying our country, and I, an American passport holder would have to admit it's also our country for myself as well. I, I feel very much an exile um, to some extent. And um, I, I, I often read Jamaica Kincaid's work in that way as well. Maybe I'm misreading, which is interesting. <laughs> but um, I would say that for me growing up, um, and this is, I feel like you're asking a question that is intellectual, but it's also very psychological. And so I want to answer it intellectually, but I, I, I think the only way to answer it honestly is to, is to talk about my own life, which is to say that for me in particular, I always felt like home was wherever my grandmother was. Uh, and because she raised me, she was, uh, she raised me and I knew very clearly that I, um, I would have been an orphan if she hadn't raised me. That was very, I understood that very early on, that my mother wasn't there, my father wasn't there, my aunts and uncles were taking care of their own stuff. And in my, the house I was raised in, there were many other cousins that were raised with me. 
So I knew that the aunts and uncles couldn't have taken me in because there were their kids with me. So, um, so my, for me, the, the uh, home was wherever she was. And I, be, I, for a long time, thought of St. Thomas in particular and her, like her body and the land as really being somehow connected in a very grand way. My grandmother has uh, passed away. And so when that happened, I had to sort of refrag my whole idea of what home was. And, um, well, this sounds so wishy-washy because I'm saying like, but, ugh. but I, so when my grandmother passed away, I was devastated, of course, right? And I had, um, I had this, one of the many dreams I had about her was that I was, um, that I, I dreamed that I was talking to her. Anybody who's lost someone, you have those dreams all the time, yeah? Um, and I was asking her, like, what am I supposed to do now? What am I supposed to do? I, you know, you're my mom, basically. You are my, my understanding of myself. What do I do? And in the dream, she just looked at me, and, and she, like, nodded and smiled. And I was like, no, 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 really, I need words. What do I do? <laughs> <laughs> and she was just like, she's like, and she did a little tuggy on her ear, and I was like, I I'm listening, I'm waiting, what am I listening? And in the I, 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 I'm not shitting you, yeah? I, I started to hear somebody crying, and, I, and the crying got louder and louder, and I woke up, and it was my son, who was then an infant, sleeping in bed beside me, and I thought, oh, that's what I'm gonna do, right? I'm gonna, this is what I'm gonna do. And, I, for, and so for me now, home is wherever my family is, you know, now that I've, I feel like I've sort of stepped into my grandmother's role and now I'm the mother figure. Um, and, you know, if I'm being honest, that, that means that right now Brooklyn is home. Um, Brooklyn is where um, my husband and my two kids and I all live, so that's home. But there's also a kind of like home home, which is my grandmother's house still. And um, the house was left alone for a while since she passed and we're now cleaning it up. And I have fantasies of, you know, spending my summers there with my kids uh, so that that could be a kind of home home for them as well. We'll see. Um. <laughs> well, um, I, th I think the question um, of home, uh, it doesn't have to be uh, one singular space as... Um, I mean, the, your grandmother's home uh, it, it begins to function not only as a physical place but as a spiritual place because actually she's not there anymore. So you draw on that. And then there's your home of St. Croix and your home of, uh, uh, of Bro Brooklyn. It would be absurd for me not to say that America uh, by this time uh, is my home. I've lived here I'm 66 years of, almost 66 years of age. I've lived here since I was almost 17. Um, so it would be uh, sort of um, uh, insane, to be fair, <laughs> to say, for me not to say it's, it's home. Um, I think of Antigua also uh, as, as home. The, the thing, I think of Vermont as home, um, perhaps for people like, like us, with our history of um, the great Atlantic slave transaction, um, home is a complicated uh, issue. There's all this great longing for our home in Africa, even as we know all too well, a lot of the catastrophe that befell us um, was uh, aided by our countrymen, our home uh, people. Um, and so then we have a, a home in, in, in the places that uh, um, uh, we are from, but they don't really support us, so we go to different places. It's, I think the complication of home for people who look like you, you and me uh, comes about because we are, at, we, are we are at a loss. Historically, we are from the defeated people, the people who, who lost uh, memory in that great journey from one end of the earth to, to the other. So it's not... Um, I mean, it's, it's, you know, I mean, I, I don't think Henry Kissinger, who comes from Germany, um, who says, oh, I don't know where my home is. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't think 
or, or that ridiculous man from Texas, Cruz, who's born in Canada. I don't think he says, oh, home, where? I mean, he's running for president, and he's, you know, so I think that that's really um, uh, not at all to be, um, we, we can't beat ourselves up over uh, definitions of home, and in fact, it perhaps might be quite a plus that we can, uh, uh, um, quite a positive thing, that we have various places we call, home, we call home, that in fact the world is our home. And then we can also find pockets of um, personal, com personal identity, your grandmother, um, my mother and her family in Dominica as, as, as home. They, they are, they are support, spiritual supports. I think we're, we're kind of lucky that we are not, we are at home everywhere, or everywhere is a home. Um, out of this catastrophe can come this wonderful thing. Thank you. That was a, a wonderfully and somewhat surprisingly optimistic response, I have to say. Um, Rescue my American. No, that mess. was wonderful. <laughs> I'm grateful. I'm an African-American. Um, it has been signaled to me that my time um, is up in terms of being the one who gets to possess these two writers. I do get to have dinner with them, so I will, eat, I will ask more questions. Um, but I'm now going to open up the uh, floor to questions. First, to students, if that's all right. And if you don't hurry up and ask something, I'm going to ask more questions. So. Um, thank you for your question. Um, uh, I also teach an undergraduate class called Taurus and Natives, the, uh, where we actually read uh, a small place. And, um, and my novel in great part is actually about tourism and how um, in, in about the 1950s and 60s when our rum economy and then our agricultural economy um, disappeared, we sort of reached out at, and grabbed onto tourism, as was happening all over the region, and how that really fucked us up, um, and continues to, I think. Um, but I feel like just to give you a succinct response, I think specifically for the Caribbean, what I want the, the tourist or the traveler, the visitor to do, is to think about what the people are up to when they come. I mean, I think, I mean, this is just a, just a, I mean, I feel like I have a lot to say, but I'll just say this, that, right? <laughs> that I think, you know, when we travel to France, we're like, let's go to the Louvre. When we go to, I don't know, when we, when, when, if we go to, to, to Spain, we want to go see what Gaudi was doing with the architecture. And when we go to the Caribbean, we want to lay on the beach <laughs> and not engage with the other human beings. So it seems to me that um, our intense beauty um, has been the physical beauty of the, the place where white people come, and then they forget that human beings are part of it. And in fact, human beings are preserving that beauty, right? The, the human beings make that beauty possible. Um, and it's not that the human beings are getting in the way of the beauty, which is often how it's perceived, like the most, the, the dream Caribbean experience is to be on a deserted beach where no other people mess with you except if they're bringing you drinks. And, <laughs> and I would just like, uh, I would like the visitor, the, the traveler to come and say, you know, what art are you guys creating? Talk to me about your, uh, your architecture. Um, where are your writers? Um, you know, I, I wish people would come to the Caribbean and go to the bookstore and, um, and, and, and visit the, the museums because they're there and only you know, the students go visit them. The tourists don't go visit them. So I, I just feel like, that's, that's, like my, that's my one thing to say, that there's so much more to say, but that's, yeah. Yeah, um, it, it would be, be nice uh, if, um, you know, it's true that after a winter like this, you might be tempted, um, uh, to go to the beach and, um, you know, um, and I'm sure we, 
we wouldn't mind that. But you're, you're right about the, the bookstore. The bookstores have in them the history of how these islands uh, uh, came to be. And uh, the, the, the way you go to, the, you mentioned the Louvre, or the way you go to Vienna, you, you go to these places to enhance yourself. You go to these places so that when you return home, you know, you are, um, you are a, be a better person. You are culturally uh, buff, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, uh, so to speak. And, and so we rather, w it, it seems the ethical uh, thing to do when you go, go to these places, uh, the way you have a cup of cocoa in Vienna, which, by the way, does not grow in Vienna, cocoa. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, chocolate is not from Switzerland, it's some, somewhere else. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, the, the essential, you, you talk about ethics, but it's, in, it's, it's not ethics, it's this thing called racism. <laughs> <laughs> what it is. Um, it's called uh, uh, racism. Ex ethics, um, ethics would be, for instance, um, me not buying these wonderful pants for $19 from Uniqlo. I should not have done that. <laughs> uh, but the thing uh, about going to these places um, to forget who you are, imagine that. You go to these places, to forget yourself, you go to forget yourself among people you do not like. You don't like these people because they're black. I, I had an amen chorus over here. Um, and and so, so the, the, the word um, in, in this particular case isn't, isn't ethics at all. And, and actually, I was thinking when you were talking about identity, America, and so on. You know, um, how, how people from her, uh, Hawaii, um, I don't mean native Hawaiians, nobody really bothers with them. They have the difficulty that you have um, of who are, uh, who are we, because uh, Hawaii is populated by white people, and uh, well, people from Hawaii, white people from Hawaii, except for our beloved, my beloved president, I love <laughs> I'll just expose my bias here. I love President Obama. Um, <laughs> he is black. <laughs> um, but they don't have this question of identity. And, and so, of course, they are a state. And the reason they're a state is because they're mostly white people. And you will never be a state. And I feel that I have to tell the Puerto Ricans that, too. <laughs> They're not going to be a state, unless they declare they're white. They just have to start saying, we're not Puerto Ricans, we're white. <laughs> and then they'll get it. I have no view on you. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I do. I, I really don't. <laughs> I, but I don't. I mean, I, 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 I haven't thought, thought, thought about that. I, I, I went to, the first time I went to an, an African country, not Africa, a country in Africa, um, um, the uh, people I met there said to me, um, welcome home. And I was really offended. I thought, I, I'm, uh, who are you to welcome me home? This is not my home. I'm from Antigua. I really felt that way. So I don't really have um, uh, uh, a view of, uh, and I'm, I'm not even sure, is, that, is, it, is it still on, uh, something that people, um, I, I know many, oh, is it still a <laughs> so, um, <laughs> well, I am quite happy.
happy in Vermont. <clears throat> so I, um, I, have, I have thoughts about it, but, <laughs> um, but my thoughts are actually very connected to what I think Jamaica is saying, which is when I grew up, Pan-Africanism was actually very in vogue. Um, and I grew up in a rough neighborhood in the Virgin Islands. My neighborhood is called Round the Field. Um, gunshots, I mean, I, it wasn't expected that someone who was from that neighborhood would eventually become a writer and a professor. That was unbelievable. Um, and so I, I think myself and my peers from that hood, we embraced Pan-Africanism as a kind of a way to find, um, to find self-worth. But we inherited that, or we got that passed to us from the States. I and mean, it wasn't a Pan-Africanism that had come out of our um, own you know, geographic history. And this is actually despite the fact that Edward Blyden, often thought by many scholars to be the father of Pan-Africanism, is actually from the Virgin Islands. Um, we didn't know him because we are a colony, and so we didn't study our own history. So we studied American history. So we inherited Pan-Africanism not through our own history, even though it could be argued that it came from us, but we inherited it through America. So it always felt kind of foreign, and it actually didn't feel that radical. And when I first began thinking about a pan-anything, the most radical thing to me felt like a pan-Caribbeanism. And I thought, oh, that is some real shit right there. <laughs> Like, what does it mean to say that actually I am connected to Antigua and actually Trinidad has something to teach me about Jamaicanness and Jamaica has something to say about Dominica and that that's a conversation that we could be having as a people amongst ourselves felt really radical, um, which I don't know if it still is radical, but for me, it's, it's still a conversation that I'm, I'm interested in and it feels like one that that, that, that came from, from my own personal struggle and not that came from on high. So I'm a student who spends a lot of time doing extensive writing and a big problem for me and a lot of my like, fellow peers is that a lot of the people who are helping us write are white people. And a lot of the subject matter that I write about um, is not necessarily their experience, it's experiences like of my mother and, and women of color like myself, so I'm always told to cater my, like tailor my stories a bit um, with that in mind of like the majority, whoever decided that. Um, so my question to you all is, when you write, do you, how do you consider your audience and do you ever consider, I mean, because I personally feel like I write for women like me, um, but I also am working within a larger structure that's not dictated by women like me. So how do you navigate that is my question. Fuck them. <laughs> the idea of, of writing, I mean, for an audience, first of all, the idea of writing for an audience, um, uh, is so presumptuous. Just write, write, and then um, let the wider society. It, it is true you will run into a lot of crap. You know your um, uh, uh, um, male writer might. Um, I got an email from a, a scholar in Australia telling me that on page 260 of a book called Infinite Jest, my story girl had been appropriated, I think is the way he, he, he put it. Um, um, about, uh, Infinite Jest is, is, the author of Infinite Jest is considered a genius. I'm considered a black woman writer. Um, uh, from the Caribbean. You will meet that kind of thing, but that mustn't stop you. Uh, 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 as I, say, I say this over and over, and, and it's going to come back and bite me. Um, you know Paul's letter to the Corinthians? Um, see, you don't, but don't be a Corinthian. 
Um, uh, not many Corinthians probably read Paul's letter, but there are no Corinthians anymore, and Paul's letter still exists. So, when you're writing, say to yourself, I'm Paul. <laughs>